Hello, and welcome back to Refractions. I am Stephen Mallon. Thank you so much for joining us. I am so psyched that we have a very special guest, uh, Ethan Cohen from Ethan Cohen Gallery, joining us today. So, Ethan, thank you so much for being here. My pleasure to be here. Thank you, Stephen, for inviting me. And thank you, B&H, for sponsoring this. I'm excited to have a conversation. Me too. So, Ethan, if you can just uh, tell Everybody, because you touched on a little bit when we were uh, chatting early on, but can you tell uh, the audience and me uh, your history with photography? Wow. Well, I guess it began um, probably with a Kodak inst a little Instamatic when I was about uh, six and a half years old. Uh, and I began to be a photographer and interested in it. Um, I was surrounded by photographers. My mother, Joan Liebold Cohen, who's an art historian and photographer artist in her own right. Uh, I grew up with her as she was a photographer. Also my uh, older brother, uh, Peter uh, Liebold Cohen, he uh, was a filmmaker, a photographer, very into Nikons and uh, you know, videotaping. And uh, I remember when I was 10 years old, uh, we went to North Korea and he was hired by CBS to videotape with the old uh, Super 8 film. So I, I began, I was very enticed because my family was all doing it. So I think that I naturally became a photographer. And then when I hit college, uh, I was the uh, photo editor for the Harvard Crimson. Um, and that was intense because when you were the photo editor on duty, you had to roll all your own film. Uh, it's all black and white. You had to go out and cover whatever was happening, you know, in Cambridge or on campus and make sure that you didn't screw up uh, make sure you uh, had all your F stops right and your right film. And if you missed one photo for the next day's paper, you're, you were cooked. If you, uh, so you couldn't make a mistake. And then I had to uh, print out all the contact sheets and then I had to uh, print my own prints for the next day's paper all in one day. So uh, it was uh, compact, exciting, uh, exhausting, uh, fun. Um, I covered, you know, political, cultural. Uh, I was able to, I remember meeting um, uh, Bikino Aquino, who was the opposition leader in the Philippines when he was a visiting scholar at Harvard. Um, and uh, I became his personal photographer and was able to get interesting portraits. I remember Sihanouk, Prince Sihanouk, who had been hiding in North Korea, uh, or been, you know, uh, uh, sort of, uh, and he was isolating himself. And then he, when he came out of uh, isolation, uh, came to the United States and he was interviewed at Harvard. Uh, uh, and it was fascinating. Uh, and, you know, Jerry Brown, it was fun. It was exciting. We covered a lot of different people. And uh, the idea of being a paparazzi was exciting. Um, but I like to get people um, naturally uh, uh, and I, I remember my, my my best photo was I was off duty one day. I was at the Hasty Pudding Club sitting in a middle section. I, I had my camera, but I was not on duty. But then Meryl Streep had won the award that year and she sat right next to me. And then all, all of a sudden the lights hit her and I had my camera and I said, oh my God. So I, I snapped. And those were some of the most interesting photos that I've taken. Um, but I've photographed in Asia, uh, Burma, China, Japan, Korea, um, uh, all over the world. And, uh, but it was, my mother was my mentor. She had been uh, a slide, uh, I guess, a researcher at the Corcoran at Yale. And so she knew how to organize her slides, you know, pre Photoshop, she had her slide table and would always organize lectures using her slides and, you know, understand growing up with Kodachrome and Polaroid. Um, and uh, so really it's been fascinating. Uh, the life I've, how photography has influenced me visually uh, in my lifetime. What were you, so you just glazed over the fact that you were at Harvard, which is amazing to me. Um, what were you studying there? I studied uh, East Asian studies. Uh, you know, I, I had no idea that I was going to be an art dealer. I, I knew that I was interested in art. Uh, I studied art history. Uh, I think my favorite professor in college was John Rosenfield. He was an extraordinarily um, wonderful speaker. Uh, he got our interest peaked always when he was speaking. Uh, he was so um, convincing about his subjects, if it were architecture, if it was the history of, you know, Japanese, you know, uh, 18th century painting or looking at ceramics. Uh, 
uh, he just he, he made art sort of magical and uh, made me more curious. And I think he really was one of my major inspirations um, and uh, as a uh, pursuer of the arts. And I think my mother, who's a lecturer, uh, also my father, who was a law professor, um, as teachers, uh, I like sharing uh, with uh, my friends, the public. Um, I like to curate. Uh, I like uh, sharing uh, visual messages. And I think that's probably what led me to becoming an art dealer and curator. And I've always been a collector, but I like to document um, when I'm meeting people. Uh, I even to this very day, I've been a I'm working on a book right now using my iPhone, uh, using portrait mode uh, of these. I photograph all the time, my friends, my colleagues, the artists, um, collectors, uh, people in the street I see. Um, something interesting. I, I'm always looking for something, uh, and I, the iPhone has been so practical. And I've, I've had, you know, other cameras. I've had the Fuji. I have, you know, I had a Leica, uh, Nik, uh, Nikon. Um, but the iPhone, it's just so convenient. It's not heavy. I can put it in my pocket. Uh, and so I've, I've focused. I've sort of focused on this now for the last uh, few years. Uh, one of my dear friends and artists I collaborate with. Uh, Margaret Innerhofer, she had, you know, when she saw a lot of my portraits, she said, oh, Ethan, you've got to do a book. So she sort of, she sort of pushed me along. And I, I appreciate Margaret for, you know, in, in inspiring me to do it. And I think that I'm now working on with my colleague, uh, a book on portraits. So that's exciting. So I, I've never stopped being a photographer, but I really appreciate photography. And I love showing photography. And um, we have uh, three fantastic shows currently in my gallery in Beacon, New York, in the Cube Art Center, which is about an hour and a half north of New York City. Um, it's an hour and a half by car, hour and a half by uh, train. We're very close to the Dia Center. Uh, the Dia is about three minutes away from us. And the Dia is one of the greatest museums in the world uh, for art of the 1980s. And so my uh, art center, the Cube, is really dedicated to showcasing contemporary artists' art practice. What are you doing today? What's being made now? And I think that um, we have uh, four main galleries in the building. Uh, we have uh, five experimental spaces and a sculpture garden. So I feel very fortunate uh, to have spaces that I can open up to artists to exhibit in a very sophisticated way um, and bringing uh, the New York art scene to Beacon, New York, or bringing Beacon to New York. I mean, it's a, it's fun. I mean, bringing the world into Beacon. I think that uh, Beacon is a very special little community. Um, some people call it the North Brooklyn, or they call it the Second Bushwick, or even <laughs> with Red Hook last night. It's a little like a Red Hook. Uh, we have uh, very interesting uh, people who live in Beacon. Many artists, uh, creatives, musicians, writers. Um, uh, political artists, activists, um, uh, and it's a small town. It's the smallest city in the state of New York. Uh, it's on the Hudson River, um, and there are wonderful shops and great restaurants. And we uh, we uh, we were one of the sort of stopping uh, places if you are interested in looking at art. And I'm based in the old Beacon High School, which is on Fishkill Avenue in Verplank. And we have actually public sculpture around the building. And we have over 60 artists in the building. We have three recording studios for music. We have uh, many, many artists, uh, many of them extraordinarily talented. One of our artists uh, won a Guggenheim, many teachers, uh, Pratt, uh, Hunter, um, uh, artists who work in the, in the Whitney, in the Metropolitan, in MoMA. Uh, so, you know, the, the building is quite uh, occupied. We, as the gallery, are open on Saturdays and Sundays um, from uh, 12 to, uh, to 5. Um, and um, any Saturday, Sunday, and we're, you know, we're open, but best, best to make an appointment. Uh, we give tours. And we're about to open up our biggest show that I've ever produced there called Back to School, where we are inviting artists to take over the um, my uh, old Beacon High School, the Cube, and try to reimagine what education should have been like, or could be like, is like. And so the artists are going to take over the uh, Ron English, who's my co-curator, is going to take over the uh, 
the, the men's room and make it a smoking area. And then we're going to have, you know, uh, anatomy 101 science lab or uh, English language arts. And um, we're going to have uh, in our music room, uh, Ron is transforming it into a the uh, fame factory, sort of an Andy Warhol sort of factory experience. And we'll have a band going on. And it's going to be a very, very uh, creative um, experience. And it'll last six months. It opens on November 3rd. We're going to have a major concert with uh, Travi McCoy, who is going to perform. He's the famous hip hop star. And we'll have a, a sock hop as our opening uh, event for our... Uh, uh, What's a sock hop? Sock hop is sort of like a... Um, it's a dance where everyone takes off their shoes uh, in the gym and we sort of dance and have a concert and, you know, uh, eat some food and uh, experience uh, music and art together. So that's going to be the top. And then, then the, the 4th and 5th of November, where we officially open, is during uh, Beacon Bonfire, which is when uh, Beacon Bonfire's second annual uh, uh, performance art and music uh, 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 festival. It's a little bit, they're trying to make it into its own Burning Man type of experience where 300 performance artists take over a whole city. So our exhibition, Back to School, will be in the center of it. And we welcome people to Beacon. It, it's going to be massively interesting and captivating, good food, great music, performance. And you, you, you get a big shot in the arm of, you know, how creatives are thinking today. I feel like you really help support and like thrive on like the creative community, like just about bringing artists together and like this, this whole center about having the art center and all the people and all the shows and that, you know, the different mediums and everything. I, I, I love that. I am a huge, you know, supporter of, I was the volunteer on a board for almost 20 years, just helping photographers just because I enjoyed it so much. Can you expand a little bit on that? Like, how you feel that that is benefits both for you and as an artist, like what some of the rewards are? Yeah, well, you know, it's interesting. I, um, my business partner, uh, Ju Cheng and I um, uh, came across the old Beacon High School about 12 years ago, 13 years ago. And I was looking for a space where I could think, I could house a library, I could uh, have art storage, I could, um, just an opportunity. and. I had no idea. We came across the old Beacon High School. It was owned by the city of Beacon or the school system, and they didn't want to own it anymore. I think it was a, um, a burden um, having to think about maintaining a building. And thank God I have a business partner who had worked in construction. And prior to that, he was a uh, classical cellist uh, uh, in the Beijing Opera. But he had a lot of knowledge about, you know, humanity and how to run a building and how to repair a roof or, I mean, I don't know. Anyway, together, I, I've learned a lot. Uh, we're just like a little business who took over this uh, gigantic uh, old high school and, you know, knock on wood, uh, we're doing okay today. Um, we have a community that's vibrant and interesting. Uh, but I think I've always wanted to help the community within our building. It's like its own community. But the greater community and maybe by uh, my international um, connections or because I travel a lot, I show my uh, art gallery all over the world. I bring a lot of, you know, Chinese art to Beacon or are we bringing Turkish art or Thai art or, you know, art from, you know, Georgia. We, the former president Saakashvili, uh, sadly, he's now in jail, but he came and visited us uh, and met the mayor and, um, I was interested in linking maybe you know with the, the country of Georgia, or we're looking now. One of my former assistants is from Kazakhstan. Uh, in other words, I think Beacon may be a small city, but it's really, really rich in its creativity, its intellectual capacity. Uh, the people in our city are very special, and I think that it's very relaxed. Um, it's not in high intensity like New York. And you can really enjoy and, uh, you know, uh, looking at art and sharing art and um, also making a difference. And I think that uh, when COVID came, um, you know, I'd, I'd op I've been trying to open the gallery uh, regularly at certain hours. And, you know, how do we get people to come? And it's been an issue I've been thinking about for maybe 10 years. And I think when COVID arrived, um, I put a lot of love and attention into the cube. And the cube means K-U-B-E. It's an acronym for Kunsthal, 
Beacon, K-U-B-E, Cube. And it, it was uh, an idea that my colleagues from White Box, when I was the president of a nonprofit in New York, had uh, helped me develop uh, this idea. And uh, the Kunsthalle, it's a, it's a, it's a forum a, um, uh, for showing uh, ideas or sharing ideas and showing art. And so we're we're developing it. And, you know, brick by brick, we have repaired the roof and repaired the windows and the hallways. And we have now public sculpture in front of the building. Sometimes we had a wonderful artist who had artwork in the uh, in the trees that, you know, during the winter, you drive by and you see lighting in the huge beech tree. Um, um, so we have, you know, we have the wonderful big sculptures by Alejandro Duron uh, uh, in front of our building. We have, uh, anyway, it, different projects. And I think that uh, we're thinking of even using our roof. Maybe uh, I was talking with, uh, trying to encourage Spencer Tunick maybe to do maybe one of his projects on our roof, where, you know, maybe from a drone where we, he could be photographing, you know, a thousand naked bodies on our roof. That we <laughs> um, and so, you know, we're, we're just totally open. I, I think that, um, you know, the community, we run a small business. Uh, we have uh, many studios in the building, but uh, I have my own spaces in that building and that I open up to the public. And um, uh, we open, you know, Saturdays, Sundays all year, and it's been working well. I've had a lot of help from my local friends and artists community, uh, Donald Mickelson, who is a colleague and a brilliant artist in her own right, and Joseph Ayers, who helped me quite a bit, and Isaac Aiden, uh, who helped me uh, almost seven, eight years ago, uh, transform our old library into our main gallery. And I have a huge movable wall that can transform the main gallery space. It's about 12, 13, 14 feet high by five feet wide and on wheels, and it moves around and it can tr transform the space. And I think the current exhibition um, two exhibitions uh, in that space, um, Icons by Raphael Fuchs from Brooklyn. He's one of the great photographers, celebrity photographers, and his beautiful photos, Icons, is on view right now uh, in the main gallery, along with Natalie White, who has her own solo show. Of It's called The Last Shot, and a beautiful large format Polaroid uh, photograph she used. She came and over... Uh, I think two or three days, we photographed uh, friends and artists from New York and Beacon community um, uh, using the old format uh, Polaroid camera that John Reuter had used for over 50 years. And he was the uh, head of that camera who sh he shared and collaborated with, you know, all the great artists from Chuck Close to Robert Rauschenberg to everybody. And so Natalie White, uh, she bought the last remaining uh, expired large Polaroid film. And she generously brought that with John Reuter uh, to photograph us. And we have this fantastic exhibition of, uh, you know, people and double exposures. It, it's a beautiful show. So it's open this weekend. And then next weekend, I think is our last uh, weekend. It's been running for several months now. And um, it's on Instagram under Cube Art Center. Uh, uh, and uh, you can see that and come visit us. And um, uh, also, I think we are under our website under Ethan Cohen Gallery, and you can make an appointment at the Cube. Um, then we have Margaret Innerhofer, who is also a very, very talented photographer, um, now a, a resident of Beacon, also also of New York. Uh, her show called Shadowland, and it's it, it's really um, uh, surprisingly interesting that she has brought beauty to upstate New York to like, you know, when you see, you know, in the landscape, sometimes beat up old cars she, or certain beat up old buildings. She has been able through her mastery in understanding the camera, how to capture a picture that is beautiful, interesting, romantic, and, you know, uh, acquirable. And so we've sold quite a number for photos uh, and we installed her show in the old science room which was a challenge. How do you transform a science room into a gallery? But uh, she did it uh, with my team, uh, Joseph and me um, and uh, Margaret. Uh, and uh, I think we did a very interesting, innovative job. Uh, we put her, her title of her show, Shadowland, on our window. And so you're looking out into the landscape of Beacon and it, it's just, it's beautiful. And I think that, um, you know, we're getting noticed. I, I think that, you know, um, we've done over, really 12 years of programming. And I think really interesting is uh, Arts Mid-Hudson just gave us an award 
uh, that I was very flattered by um, that I think we're going to get, I think on the 11th of October, we're a leading, the leading arts organization in the Hudson Valley, which is really fantastic. I mean, there are a lot of other very deserving arts organizations that I love um, who are equally worthy. And I, I'm not sure why they, only, you know, you know, pick us, but I'm, you know, <laughs> blessed. You must be doing something right. <laughs> no, no, no. Really, you know, honestly, I, I'm flattered. Um, I, I, I really think that it, it gives me um, the energy, the desire to give back to my community even more than I've been giving. And that's really wonderful. I think, you know, I think that it gives me great pleasure to bring innovative shows to our community, to our greater community. Um, and so, you know, Beacon is really on the map now. And uh, there's so many interesting, you know, uh, uh, art centers, galleries in our area. Uh, and I think that, um, you know, I'm excited. It's a whole new wave of uh, uh, ways to appreciate art and seeing it. Absolutely. You had mentioned earlier about the uh, your gallery going worldwide. Was that in connection to all the art fairs that you've done in the past? And what was, I, I couldn't quite hear you. My gallery had... Oh, you were you were saying earlier that the um, your gallery has gone like internationally, and were you talking about doing the different art fairs? Yes. Can you talk a little bit more about that, like what your experience is, and like which art fairs have worked for you, and like because I'm fascinated about that business model because I think it's such a difficult setup where you've got like 72 hours to sell tens of thousands of dollars of art to like break even basically, and so the pressure and stress level, I think is, is pretty high. And, you know, I've seen a couple of booths and everything with a, you know, a, a posted on it saying, sorry, you know, the shipper didn't show up and they've literally been sitting there with no art and everything. But anyway, that's the, you know, worst case scenario. But um, so what are some of the fairs that you've uh, participated in? Well, it's a great question. I, I love it. And, you know, um, it's funny. I've never, <laughs> I, well, I'll give you a few, uh, few ideas of where we go. Uh, art, you know, on Hong, I go to Hong Kong. Um, uh, we go to Singapore. We go to Basel. Uh, we go to Chicago. Uh, we've been to Istanbul. Um, um, all, you know, Washington. Um, I, I can't think of all the. I mean, I've been all over the. We've done, you know, fairs for many years now. Um, I've been doing it for over over twenty five years. I started, I think, art fairs with the Scope Art Fair, I think in 2000, around 2001 or 2002 or something, maybe in New York. I went to Miami. I was a curator for Scope when there was just Art Basel, Scope, and Nada. Um, and there are very few collectors, actually. And you know, it was so interesting. I got many of my New York collectors from Miami because in New York, they're too busy. But in Miami, they're relaxed. And they got time. And they come and look. And they really look at art. And you, know, you get to know people. So it's interesting. It, you know, I think Art D-Link takes time. Um, but no, we've gone all over the world and I've shown in Beijing. Uh, that has been really interesting. I've never felt intimidated by an art fair. Actually, it's so the opposite. I think for me, the art fair is a incredible opportunity to share what I'm thinking. You know, what are the artists that I feel, you know, excited about or inspired by and how do I want to show it? And so curatorially, that's the challenge. How do we show in a small space, um, you know, artists, effectively, uh, or artworks effectively. Um, another, I remember uh, I, I did many years ago, maybe 15 years ago, uh, an art fair in Australia, uh, in Melbourne, uh, for Melbourne Art Fair. And um, um, I brought the first time, I had no idea what the Australian public would like. And um, I brought a very eclectic, interesting exhibition of Chinese contemporary art, of ink art, plus global artists who did dealt with ink also. And it was beautiful, powerful, good names, and everyone loved it, but I didn't sell anything. And so <laughs> I go all the way to Australia, like, oh my. <laughs> but um, then two years later, they invited me back. Um, and I was going through a uh, personal sort of family, going through a difficult period. And it was a challenge for me. I needed to sort of show who I was. And I I didn't want to spend a lot of money on shipping. So I decided I would curate a show that would only fit into a large portfolio, about 24 inches by um, 20 inches, that I could carry on the airplane. So I brought about 60 different artworks by 
30 different artists, all based in New York. And I created a, um, a sort of like a um, laundry, uh, all these laundry lines with metal. I put metal wire all across my uh, booth at right about high, uh, eye level. And then I clipped on little, uh, you know, laundry clips, wooden clips, and put all these artworks, you know, clipped uh, with uh, them. And it was, it was like putting out your laundry. And it was really art from New York, what was, I found interesting. And it was so exciting. I, um, I, uh, I sold everything. It was like, much, wow. and it was, it was the, most, the biggest, and it was so exciting for the artists. And I had realist artists, I had abstract artists, I had photographers, you know, and it was really interesting. And um, wow, I said, wow, this is exciting. I really, it, it was really a full, full circle. And, um, you know, every time I go to the Volta Art Fair in Basel, Switzerland, every June, uh, for me, uh, it's a wonderful opportunity to connect with my community. I think we're one community. I think, you know, what's interesting is sometimes, you know, painters and sculptors and photographers, you know, we're all very competitive. And I remember in Japan, the joke was when you're in Harajuku, you take a 100 yen uh, coin on your finger and you flip it over your head and you're going to hit a photographer on his or her head. For sure. <laughs> That's how many photographers there were in Harajuku in Tokyo. Um, but we are all one community. Uh, we are maybe, you know, point, you know, point, you know, zero, zero, one of the percentage of the population, but we all love art. We are almost a family and we come together for the, you know, Venice Biennale. We come for art fairs, uh, exhibitions. Um, so we are a community. And I think that, um, uh, that's uh, very important. So when I was in Basel um, every year, for me, it's my opportunity to show what really I think is important to think about. And uh, so I always thematically have a curatorial concept and uh, people appreciate it. And, you know, you, you sell, you don't sell, but you, you, you fill your, your tank up with, you know, uh, the important nectar that keeps me running for the next year. And I think that, um, you know, Basel was a little bit tough the last two or three years ago. This past year, uh, we had a wonderful venue and uh, we showed a diverse number of artists, like Gallo Zeri and um, Abudia, the leading uh, graffiti artist from Africa right now. He's the 11th biggest seller at, uh, in au at auction. He, he, I'd grown up with him for 10 years. It's an amazing ride where he was like peanuts, you know, $2,000 and now it hit last summer. Um, at Christie's, 607,000 for the same size painting, crazy, crazy. But I think that, you know, this idea of sharing ideas, of sharing the love, sharing the creativity of artists, photographers uh, is so important. And, you know, to be a really good artist, to be a really good photographer is so difficult. How do you define yourself? How do you stand out? How do you, through your you know, maybe a camera and it's actual real film or digital, or how do you, it, it's, it, we all have the same maybe um, uh, tools, but how diverse and, you know, crazily innovative artists are. And I think that what was interesting, John Reuter, the son who is, you know, he was the gentleman who, who runs the large Polaroid camera. Um, he and Natalie gave, well, he gave a, our third distinguished lecture series at the Cube Art Center this the summer to talk about his collaboration with artists. And the, all the artists that he's collaborated with were always with the large format Polaroid camera. And, but it's so interesting how he made, you know, work with, I don't know, a hundred different artists, how each of those artists have really used the Polaroid camera so differently. And I, I, the richness of having a defined um, boundaries or you know uh, tools that you can use, and how creative artists can be within that closed setting, what was blew my mind, and that's always fascinating. I mean, I think that you know when you think of ink painting, like this ink painter behind me, his name is Chin Feng. He's a Chinese painter from China, one of the great art uh, contemporary ink painters. Um, ink painting is not dead. You know, I meet artists every week who will convince me that ink is so interesting. We have not seen everything. When you think you've seen everything, you certainly have not. So there's always artists going to break, break the mold from the past. And it's, it's exciting. I think that's why I found art always uh, enriching, uh, exciting, never boring. And I think I'm, you know, I feel very lucky that I, I fell into this uh, profession um, because there's no real, you know, school 
to become an art dealer. Um, and there's no one way to Rome. There are many roads to Rome. And how, I, that, when did you open your first gallery? Like, how did that, because we, we mentioned that scope was 25 years ago. So was that right when the beginning of the gallery or was it before then? No, I actually, I began my career uh, as an art dealer, actually in college. Uh, I started, uh, I took a year, uh, my junior year abroad in Japan. And I uh, became very interested in Japanese contemporary prints. And that year, I also had met many of the early Chinese avant-garde, uh, the star star artists, including Ai Weiwei um, and uh, Wang Keping. I don't know, uh, behind me, there's a large sculpture behind me up here on the right, on my right here. Or, uh, you're, um, th that sculpture is by Wang Keping. And he, it was a political sculpture at the time. Um, it's, it's an image half Mao, half Buddha. And it was uh, the Chinese government at the time in the early 80s wanted to confiscate it. So he hid it. The Taiwanese government wanted to mass produce it. Um, and uh, as, as a political, it was called the idol. And um, so it's so interesting is that um, the Chinese artists, so during college, I began to become friends with them and try to help Chinese artists find galleries in the United States. And um, 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 then um, uh, I was interested in Japanese art and basically the Chinese art grew and it, it, it got, ex you know, expanded. And I, I sort of, I, I actually, I, I first went to Pierre Matisse um, and Pierre Matisse, who at the time represented Zhao Wuqi, who was a famous um, uh, Chinese innovative abstract painter. And I explained to uh, Pierre Matisse that there were these, all these new generation of artists and maybe he could consider representing. And he was the grandfather of friends of mine who I grew up with in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And so he was very polite. He was not off-putting. Um, he was encouraging. He said, you know, I'm 80 years old. Uh, you know, I've, I, I have so many artists. I, <laughs> he was like, you know, the number one dealer in the world. And here I was this young punk uh, asking him, you know, to take on these Chinese artists. Uh, and, but he said, you know, go out there. You, you know, maybe there are other galleries that could help you or maybe start your own. Um, and eventually I, I opened up my own gallery out of frustration um, because there were not galleries who are willing to take on the, you know, uh, the voice of all these Chinese artists. So I started really uh, in 1987. Um, and in that group, uh, Ai Weiwei was one of those artists. Uh, in 1988, we did his very first solo show called Old Shoes Safe Sex. Um, and, um, uh, you know, he told me, uh, I had said in 87, when I uh, was talking to him, he said, when you're ready, let me know. And he said, well, I'm very lazy. And I, so about eight, nine months later, he came back to me and said, okay, I'm ready. And it was exciting. It was a period of AIDS. Uh, he, we, we had no idea what AIDS was and how do you protect yourself? And uh, our, we were hearing our friends were dying around us. Um, and, um, um, uh, Weiwei took a uh, Chinese army raincoat and he put a condom into the raincoat and put a gasket on it and he put it on a hanger and they made a frame that he made himself in his friend's wood shop, uh, a framing shop, and then uh, hung it into our gallery. And that was uh, actually how Weiwei was going to visually protect himself against AIDS. And then he also produced uh, another piece, a one man shoe, where he took a leather pair of shoes that he could never afford in China. He cut them in half, sewed them together, and where you could actually put your feet in, and you could, you know, wear you could actually sort of wear these shoes, and then um, you could step out of them. Um, it was called one man shoe. And then he also came up with the uh, he was enamored with uh, Marcel Duchamp and also uh, Jasper Johns, and he came up with this idea to create a profile of Marcel Duchamp in a coat hanger. And in fact, just behind me, you can sort of see that piece here. Oh. On my yeah, where it's actually, a, um, this is actually an addition, way, way copied the original piece he did for me, but this is actually in ceramic, but it's a coat hanger, um, uh, in, uh, it's a frame with a beautiful wooden frame, but it's the profile of Duchamp um, in a uh, coat hanger that also, uh, way, way may have also seen a little bit of inspiration from Jasper Johns, um, but these are two artists that way, way, was uh, aspiring, uh, who he loved and ad admired, and little did, and he loved Ai Wei, uh, he loved uh, uh, Andy Warhol. Little did you know uh, Ai Weiwei know that he would become 
um, as famous uh, as many of these artists uh, in his lifetime. And I think that that's, you know, we grew up, we were young punks on the street wanting to show art. I've always loved Ai Weiwei's work. Um, he was a conceptualist, a minimalist, uh, uh, total anal uh, retentive regarding detail. Um, he would, you know, he would uh, cut a, a hammer in half or he would cut a hatchet or, you know, the ha hammer a sickle. He would, um, and, you know, sometimes, you know, he would um, um, make these wonderful landscapes using fur, you know, as his brush strokes. So he, he was always looking, you know, a little bit, you know, Merritt Oppenheim, op, you know, influenced, uh, but he, he had many influences, but Wei Wei, um, knew he was Chinese. Um, and I think, you know, maybe some of his really iconic pieces where he takes a Ming dynasty table, a square table, cuts it in half, and he pieces it back together and puts two legs on the wall, two legs on the ground, and there are no nails. And he, he repairs it in a way that you don't know that it was not made in the Ming dynasty. And so, you know, what is what has he produced? Has he produced kitsch? Has he produced uh, decorative art? Has he produced contemporary art, modern art? Um, what is it? Is it functional art? Um, so I love how Weiwei um, respects materials, but then innovates and challenges our understanding of what we're looking at. And I think that, uh, so Weiwei is one of the artists who I really always found fascinating. Um, but I don't know, I'm, I'm an educator. You know, that's really what I do. I think I'm very lucky. I think I'm a little bit like my parents, maybe following their footsteps. I love to look, find, discover and share and uh and uh with the public it's fantastic i love the the image of just you bringing these asian artists to different galleries saying hey i found this wonderful work you should have it give it a show and all the galleries are like who are you and no and then you're just like all right fine so i'm gonna open my own gallery so that got you start where was the first space uh the first space um was on 52 green street uh it's in soho um, I was walking up the street uh, with uh, Mada Shang, who is one of the other star star artists, and another artist named Yen Li. And we looked up and there was this for, for rent sign on the second floor of this uh, metal shop area. And, um, you know, so I knocked on the door. Um, at the time, I was designing clothing and accessories for Diane von Furstenberg. So my day job from nine to five, Monday through Friday, was designing for Diane. Uh, I was her designer. Uh, and then um, from six to 11 o'clock every night, uh, I would be fixing up this space that we rented for $1,000 a month. And uh, it was the right price. And I said, okay. And so we opened you know, uh, on the weekends. And that's how I began to create a space uh, in 1987. Um, and it was a oasis for the Chinese avant-garde. Um, and... Uh, I actually did a birthday party for my uh, best friend from college, who is from Nigeria. We even showed his collection of Nigerian art. This is like some 35 years ago. So, and um, that that began my interest in African art. I mean, I I liked the art, but I knew there was even more interesting art to be had. And I think that you know, 30 some years later, now I've become very interested in African contemporary art, and I've become a serious uh, collector and curator and. A representative of many interesting voices from Africa. And I love tribal art. I've become a big uh, sort of collector of tribal art and understanding. I never studied anthropology in college, but every week is for me, uh, you know, 101, 201, uh, and 301 classes in studying anthropology, under, trying to understand um, uh, decorative history of, you know, tribal art. Um, and uh, it's it's exciting and how tribal art has influenced uh, so many modern artists, you know, Picasso, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And um, we have an exhibition actually right now in my gallery in New York called Abudia X Picasso X Paik X Tribal. And it's, a, it's an exhibition that is really close to my heart because it shows how through tribal art influenced so significantly Picasso, even Namjoon Paik, which I had no idea who was the, the father of video art, um, it, uh, I'm showing two masterpieces that have I've never seen before that incorporate African masks into Namjoon Paik's painting, which is crazy. And then uh, shows Abudia and the influence of Picasso on, uh, or you know, uh, tribal art on Picasso and how it's so similar to Abudia, who is an emerging contemporary artist from uh, Ivory Coast, and the he, uh, who 
basically depicts children's faces and bodies and very interesting eyes that look very similar to what Picasso was actually um, also portraying. And what's so interesting is I have a, a beautiful king's crown that's about 125 years old from Nigeria, Yoruba tribe, that is a colorful crown that looks like Keith Haring, looks like Abudia, looks like Picasso. And this is 125 years old. And it's extraordinary um, that uh, the iconography links these artists all together. And um, anyway, if you have time, I, I encourage you to come visit. Uh, we're open Tuesday through Saturday uh, from 11 to 6 uh, at, uh, on 19th Street, uh, 251 West 19th, uh, Ethan Cohen Gallery. And it's a very interesting show. You can see it also on Instagram. Um, and um, anyway, it, it gives me great pleasure you know, to actually uh, show that show. And in fact, I, it was inspired uh, seven years ago when I was in um, Art Basel showing at the Volta Fair, um, we went to, I went to the Beiler Foundation and there was a painting by Picasso that looked just like my African artist uh, Abudia's painting. Of, there was a very curvaceous female figure and um, the Picasso and Abudia's painting looked so similar. And then I, have a, uh, I found a sculpture that was over 125 years also from the Igbo, Igbo people of, of uh, Nigeria. And it looks so similar to the uh, Abudia. It looks so similar to the Picasso. And so when I came across the Namjoon take pieces with incorporating African sculpture, I said, oh my God, we've got to do an exhibition. And that was the birthing of this exhibition. That's where the idea came from. It's I mean, it's, it's a beautiful show. I've seen it and I, I, we got the wonderful tour from you about it. So just, you don't have the space in Soho anymore, right? It's, you've got the gallery in Chelsea, you've got a gallery, the three gallery spaces in Beacon, in Beacon. and the whole mm -hmm. art center, plus the art fairs. Is there any galleries that I missed? <laughs> Actually, two weekends ago, for a sort of crazy idea, uh, we created a new brand called publicpool.nyc. And um, uh, we wanted to create a, a brand that was different than just the gallery, uh, maybe focusing on new ideas, a little bit different than what I typically do in my gallery. And so we created this experimental joint venture with friends from uh, Bushwick. Uh, it's at uh, 792 um, uh, Metropolitan Avenue. We, my partners at Founders Lab and Preview Events um, and Ethan Cohn Gallery, we came together and I created this uh, new brand for me called Public Pool. And I have a terrifically creative staff. Uh, I work with my son, Sasha Cohen and uh, Lara Kami. And uh, I have uh, wonderful new recruits, uh, Sasha Crows Chun and Haley Antonelli, um, who are helping me and then also my colleague Donna Mickelson, who are helping uh, us, you know, be creative to the max. And uh, our first show was collaborating with Ron English, who is the famous street artist. And Ron had this vision to create a fake record store. So I said, "Sounds fantastic!" So he created over the last you know, several months uh, over 110 fake album covers of the last 50 years of music. And then he he had this idea to spin discs. It was like almost my old gallery name, Art Waves, where he actually spun discs. And I think when I created my art gallery, there was someone creating discs like that, like a little bit like, you know, Damien Hirst uh, created paintings later, though. Um, anyway, Ron made these original paintings. And so we have all these vinyl paintings, fake record covers, and it looks like a record store. It's called a revolutionary record store, Vinyl Cord. And so when you walk by, you think it's a record store and you walk in and you say, uh, the, 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 I don't know the peoples, but I know the Beatles or, you know, you, it, it's a, it's really fun. And it's a really creative, fun way. And we actually opened two Saturdays ago and um, we uh, sold a ton of, you know, fake record covers and records. And it's fun. And it's, it's fun. I mean, the price point is, you know, super easy you know, $200 uh, for an edition of 33 uh, record, fake record covers and the, the paintings, I think they're $800. It's on our uh, Instagram or our website at publicpool.nyc. And um, anyway, it, it's caught the creative, I mean, there are hundreds of thousands of followers of Ron. And, uh, you know, it, 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 it was, you know, it's about art education, having fun, being innovative. Uh, and I think Ron is one of the best uh, 
political satirist artists out there. And then he created a huge mural with his uh, smiling grin uh, um, on the building. And that'll be up for a year. So anyway, yeah, we, we're doing, we got other projects to cook at this. <laughs> so there's another gallery I didn't know about. <laughs> yeah. um, and then which art fair are you going to next? Um, we will be going to Art Miami. Uh, we are preparing uh, for uh, late November, early December. Um, and it'll be an exciting, uh, during Art Basel, uh, Art Miami is the second oldest, or maybe the oldest, Art Fair in Miami next to Art Basel. You know, Art Basel is a total experience. Over 28 art fairs at one time in Miami. It, it turns on like on steroids, Miami, and it's exciting. I mean, I encourage you, if you haven't been to Art Basel in Miami, to come for like three days, four days, um, uh, come get a, a big fix on looking at art. There's so many interesting art fairs from NADA to Art Basel to Art Miami, you know, so, you know, just, you know, it's, it's exciting. And I think that um, uh, it's a great time. Uh, and I, I fell in love with Miami because of Art Basel. You know, I, I think that Miami is a, just a fantastic place to have it. I think it was uh, Sam Keller um, uh, and Art Basel and his former colleague, I think, who, you know, brought Art Basel to Miami. What a great idea to do that. And um, I mean, it's, it's interesting. I enjoy uh, when I take my gallery on the road, Art Expo, we, uh, we did for the first time in many years um, this past year in Chicago and had a fantastic time. And, you know, it, it's, it's a high, you know, you work hard, you play hard. You know, we go down to Palm Beach um, in January, uh, or actually in, Fe in March also. Uh, March is really where Art Miami is a great fair. Uh, in March, it's it's powerful. You you meet interesting people, um, and I, I guess I'm a people's person. I, I like to share ideas and show you know um, you know what's ex what I find exciting. And I think that you know we have art from you know uh, the leading artist, uh, female painter Claudia Coca from Peru. Um, we have an African American artist like Jeffrey Hargrave. We have Abudia, who is the most incredible sensation. I don't know if you saw. Uh, two days ago, The Guardian in London had an article saying that uh, my artist, Abudia, uh, was the biggest seller at auction in the world in 12, 2022, which is, un he outbeat um, uh, uh, many of the key artists. And I, I just like, I couldn't believe that. And here's a young punk who had nothing. He, you know, he really, he he was totally impoverished. He had none of the advantages I had, you had. Um, and he is totally an American dreamer. Uh, and he is now has a foundation for children in Africa, giving back to supporting children of the street who are find themselves on the street. And you know, why do, why do they find themselves on the street? Uh, is it their fault? Is it their parents' fault? Is it society's fault? So he's trying to uh, make us all more aware of that. And I think that's very, very deserving. And, um, you know, it's it's powerful. There's so many interesting stories. Uh, but, you know, Chinese art now, you know, is being under deep, deep uh, repression. Um, because of Xi Jinping's policies. I feel terrible for all my Chinese artist friends. Um, I, I, I deeply, I, I want to get back to, you know, we, we got to communicate, we got to travel, you know, the, the airfares has got to go down so we can do shows in China, or bring shows from China to the West. Um, but, you know, right now, you know, but there's probably very interesting art being made. I mean, and some of the great photographers, uh, you know, also in, are based in China. And, um, uh, you know, uh, my mother actually, who, as I told you, was a photographer in the 1980s, she had a, a unique opportunity and she photographed the total 1980s art scene. Um, and at the time, the Chinese did not have so many cameras. There were not so many people doing it. And lo and behold, her archive of over 70,000 slides has, uh, is a very important archive that documents the avant-garde of China. We have that in the Cube Art Center. And in fact, what's exciting is Joan, um, uh, donated 16,000 of her slides to be digitized, a scan, and she's donated those now to the Asia Archive in Hong Kong for academic and for studying purposes for students and future generations. Uh, and you can visit online the Joan Liebel Cohen Archive at uh, the Asia Archive. Wow. So that's exciting. And so I think that my archive in the Cube Art Center, um, my library, um, we have you know thousands of books, thousands of slides, uh, I have, I think, the largest archive of uh, Chinese art in North America next to the Asia Archive. And um, 
I'd like to make that open to the public uh, for researchers uh, in the future. So that's what we're working on now. So that's part of the what we're doing in Beacon. There's so many amazing things. And we unfortunately are uh, just about out of time. Is there anything else you want to uh, share quickly? We got a great sense of what's going on with you. You've got a new gallery um, and venture happening in Brooklyn. You have got the gallery in Chelsea. We're going to see you in Miami. I'm coming. I'm showing in uh, Miami as well. So I'll, I'll definitely we're, be there. Oh, wonderful. I look forward to seeing you in Miami. Uh, yeah, it's going to be fun. Um, and yeah, we're neighbors here in Beacon, which is absolutely fantastic. And thank you so much for uh, sharing with us. Um, this has just been great. Well, we would love people to come discover us. I mean, uh, through my website, uh, uh, Ethan Cohen uh, Gallery, the Cube has a link. Uh, also, the gallery in New York has a link. You can make appointments. You can just come see us during normal hours. We appreciate if you do make an appointment. Uh, we can give you a private tour, potentially. Um, and, you know, come find us at an art fair or... You know, uh, you know, follow us on Instagram, uh, uh, Ethan Cohn Gallery or the Cube Art Center and uh, see what we do and see if it clicks with you and, you know, join our community and come visit us. And we'd love to know what you're doing. Um, and if you have ideas, uh, we have also art classes. We started last year. One of our great artists, uh, uh, Professor Ganyu, did a, a five day um, a life drawing class at the Cube. It was incredible. Artists of all different calibers. We were it was sort of like a master class. And uh, and Donna Mickelson will be doing some of her classes, but we're going to do have many, many, many classes going forward uh, in the cube. And so definitely follow us. All right, and thank Ethan, you, thank, thank you so much. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, you know, it's I, was... I I love I love B and H. I mean, you know, when we're when I'm serious, I I think we should have a, a, a you should interview like give us the guide of how to buy a better camera or what we should be buying or what we should be knowing about B and H. And you know, I think that's uh, you know, uh, luckily I have a son who's very uh, up on. He's also a photographer. I forgot to mention that he's a great photographer. So he's keeping me uh, up there. And um, but yeah, B and H. Thank thank you so much for sponsoring Stephen and this talk. And thank you Stephen for having me. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Ethan. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. I will be back in two weeks with the, uh, another guest and uh, hopefully see you all on the beach in Miami in December. Yeah. Right. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Bye. Cheers.